Good to see everyone this morning. Uh, I was just t uh, talking to Daniel here, and we, I was thinking this, and he said it out loud. It's, he said, it's, it's funny that there's so few people interested in ethics around here, <laughs> being that we're in the business school. Uh, um, and they, they invited a, a, a theology person here. I, by training, have done theology, but I consider myself more of a historian. Uh, who works in the theolo theological world. In fact, uh, the reason that I'm here today to talk is because uh, about, I don't know, four months ago, I gave a, a talk in Indianapolis on the theology of cybersecurity, uh, which I'm not going to go into today, but if you want to, we can talk about that another time. It will, it will cover some of, some of the uh, same areas that we talked about. I was also told that uh, there would be a little intro and then go into, into the presentation uh, and then have some conversation. Um, I just want to warn you, just, you know, trigger warning here. I'm using Prezi for those of you who know what that is. It's sort of like uh, uh, PowerPoint as a mime. It kind of goes around, right? You know, some of you know about uh, Prezi. Uh, I, I like the style of Prezi, so I hope you, t you also enjoy it. Uh, so I want to tell a little story first. This is sort of the background. This is not about me per se, but it's about my family, and it actually fits into the larger uh, narrative of what our conversation here today is about. And one of the key, key points here is information. I want you to all think about what this term information means today, okay? So digital eth ethics and the paradox of privacy in the modern world, what is that? Okay, so the first story I'm gonna tell you here is, it's the how the mushroom saved civilization and led me to a path of information discovery. I bet you can't wait to hear this story. So in the beginning, I'll tell you, there are these two gentlemen here, Herman Knaust and his brother Henry. Herman is my great-grandfather, this gentleman right here. And that's him next to that cart, uh, that wagon of mushrooms. Now, you think, oh, mushrooms, what, what, what purpose are mushrooms? Well, it turns out in the Hudson Valley where they lived, uh, they, they found some caves and caverns, and they started cultivating mushrooms. In fact, they were so good at this that they became the world's largest producer of mushrooms in a small town in upstate New York. And along the, along the Hudson Valley, there were, still are, uh, several caverns, and they bought them up basically for nothing and cultivated mushrooms in there for decades. Some, some time on, uh, my great-grandfather was uh, rabbit hunting, and he was going around in the woods, and he found a a hole, but it wasn't a rabbit hole, it was actually a, an iron mine that had been vacated, and he, he thought, well, here's another place that I could purchase and uh, do work in my, with my mushroom farming. But he had some other ideas too, because at the same time, the world was, was in flux, as it always seems to be, and there were, there were a lot of uh, changes going on, there were, the World War II, and uh, there were a lot of refugees, and so he thought to himself, well, I'm storing mushrooms in these caves, but maybe I can store something else in there because there were some people in the eye of the rabbit. The actual picture here of uh, refugees from Europe who had come over after World War II who had basically lost everything, their identity, their information, their, their paperwork, and what, what had become of everything that had uh, identified who they were. Very, of course, very important subject today. And so in the purchase, of this mine, he thought, well, maybe we can secure material, information, data, people's personal information, but also corporate information. And so what he did was he, he decided that he was going to convert this iron mine into a, a secure facility for personal information. And so he did that, and he decided he was going to take this on the road and, and, and promote it and get people to buy into it. And so he did that. And that is an actual picture of him with General Douglas MacArthur. As you can see, rabbit tested, MacArthur approved. This is, a, uh, this is the uh, iron mine that he had converted into a, uh, an underground storage facility, secure as it got. And that is today what is known as Iron Mountain Corporation. I don't know how many of you know, how many people have heard of Iron Mountain before, right? It's one of the leaders in information storage protection and management. Uh, this is an actual statement from the website of Iron Mountain uh, about his, uh, the work that he had done and the, the ideas that he came to thinking about this in the, the post-World post War II era. And so the legacy of the mushroom, of mushroom farming and his decision to come to this, uh, he 
founded, he founded the uh, Iron Mountain Atomic Storage uh, Company in 1951, died just about 20 years later. They restructured in the mid-70s, uh, created other facilities, expands to um, New England and other, other markets, acquires other corporations. 1995, they hit their first $100 million in annual revenue. Today, it's $3.5 billion. Uh, the, the key year here, though, is 2001. And what happened in 2001? 9-11. The Twin Towers had about 10 million square feet of usable space. And as we know, that was all destroyed. Um, shortly thereafter, uh, that's what a phone used to look like, by the way. Uh, my mother got a phone call. That's not my mother, but a mother. Got a phone call from uh, the CEO of Iron Mountain at the time. This guy, that's not him, that's Rockefeller. Um, and he said he wanted to thank her for the work that my uh, great-grandfather had done in developing Iron Mountain. Um, I always say, I, I saw this picture when I was putting it up and I thought, why, he, he's actually more a Texan than I am uh, wearing that hat there. But they wanted to say that, you know, the work that he had done and developed in the forethought that he had was really beneficial um, in saving the world. Not really. Okay, that's, uh, that's hyperbole there. But actually, what the point of that was that the information that was secured in what became the Iron Mountain Corporation was material that had been backed up, that had only existed in, in the backup space. There were, there were legal documents in the, in the World Trade Center. There were business documents. There were uh, um, uh, all sorts of material, personal information, corporate information, that if it had not been backed up at Iron Mountain, there would have been a, you know, major, major uh, losses. And so this, you know, looking at how this fit into the larger question of what is information and how does that play a role in the, the world that we're in today made me think that the operation of, of Iron Mountain uh, led me onto something that was, uh, you know, something ins inspirational. And so that's one of the main reasons that I went into librarianship. And as I have some of my colleagues here know that it's not this, it's this, right? Uh, we see ourselves, I think, as uh, something perhaps different, knowing the jobs that we have. Oh, I see she's shaking her head back, th back there. Um, as, as something that uh, is uh, far more diverse and nuanced than uh, you know, warehousing books. So let's get into the, the, uh, the, the crux of the conversation here, which is this paradox. And so you have different phases of understanding information, right? So Iron Mountain uh, and its, its uh, approach was that information has value, right? Seeing when my great-grandfather was rabbit hunting and thinking about refugees, he thought information had, has value and needs to be protected, right? Sticking in the mountain, people. That was his idea. <laughs> okay, now, Information has value, let's commodify it. That's the second phase, right? So, so then what do we do? People have information, let's commodify it. So information has value, but also people have value. So what happens? Okay, why well, just let the information sit there? Let's make money on it, right? So people as information, let's commodify. What is, wait, what does that mean, right? Uh, we can talk about Amazon later, but this is an important key here. So this is where the privacy paradox comes in. I didn't come up with the privacy paradox, but I'm tweaking it for our conversation to today. So in the 21st century, how do we as human beings balance the desire to be social animals while protecting our personal information, especially when we are drawn in by society and bound by the rules of giant tech? Okay, we the people. So first we have to recognize what it means to be human, right? As human beings, we value recognition, we value respect, and that's what we require to be functioning human beings. As the self in society, we respond to how society responds to us, you know, if, if we, we work within those parameters. And this brings in the question a lot, I, I saw this, uh, it was in the Great, Great Britain, they said that Great Britain has a loneliness minister now because the uh, the state of, of loneliness is so high and affecting negatively on society 
uh, that uh, this is something that needs to be dealt with. So the question of how we are in society, but also how we withdraw or not. Do we do it purposefully or do we do it not? Uh, is that forced upon us? And then how we go in finding our solitude or loneliness and turning into technology. I, I, I'm adding these two. This is the classic uh, Norman Rockwell painting made as a, uh, as a cartoon. As our, as this is a comparison of what you know, we used to think it was going to Thanksgiving dinner or a dinner. And as you can see, everybody is using technology and kind of turning, turning in on themselves. So social media, this, this is the big, you know, big question of, of, the, uh, of the hour. Um, there are some uh, analysts who say that social media, there are four kinds of people, four kinds of users. Uh, I'm sure this could be contested, but sort of the overarching uh, users are those that are relationship builders. You can see those who use the platforms to connect window shoppers, those who watch people but don't post or share much information, town criers, the self-styled journalist, activist, I'm sure we all have friends like that, right? One of our 43,000 Facebook friends. Um, and then the selfies, those who are chronic selfie publishers. I'm sure we could, we could tell immediately where our friends and ourselves even fit into those categories. Now, e-social behaviors, when social media has real world, world effects, now, how many of you have heard this expression, FOMO, a few of you? I actually learned this word the other day. Actually, SMU has a, a, a bulletin board. You know that one, right? That's all one. It says, hashtag FOMO, right? And I, I, told, I told some people that I, and they didn't know what it was. Actually, I learned a term the other day. It's called JOMO. Has anybody heard of JOMO? These, these terms come out like that. It's the joy of missing out, right? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe more apropos, right? So getting to what this, this idea of social media and how we, what kind of users are and how we participate in it, or fear of missing out, there's also the question of the other side, the privacy side, the question of what is the data and information that we're putting out there doing and who's looking at it, right? So we're f we have, you know, we may suffer from fear of missing out, but we're also, you know, we're sharing on social, me social media. There's personal data points such as locations, purchases, products you like, friends, types of jobs, so on and so forth. These are all data points. To us, they may be just, we're having fun, we're enjoying, we're letting people know. But to this other that's out there, the un un undefined, undisclosed other, it's sort of like God in a way. Sorry, theology talk here, but it, who's listening, right? Now, I gotta show you this in terms of how we, how we, uh, it, within these data points and sharing on sh social media, how do we present ourselves? And how does this affect perceptions of authenticity and judgment? Have you, I don't know, if, has anybody seen this video? No, this, no, this show. Have people seen that before or not? Mm -hmm. What's that? <laughs> I know. <laughs> so, so it gives you a sense of presentation. We call this self-curation, right? Um, uh-oh, where'd it go? Okay. I, I just wanted to throw this up here. I, I found this, this uh, uh, statistic uh, about a week or two ago. I don't know if you, have anybody heard this statistic? 40% of millennials now, I'm not picking on millennials, it's just, that's, that's the citation. <laughs> Choose their vacation destination on how Instagrammable their destination is. It's an interesting, interesting statistic, right? So what does this all, all mean? So. We have different kinds of behaviors that we are adapting to because of the online social media environment. So, and th this, there's no strict rule here, it's just that in many cases this is what's happening, right? So, e-behaviors, sometimes more confrontational, sometimes less, less responsibility, ability to hide, ability to be anonymous, ability to troll and manipulate. We've all heard these, these terminologies. We're in the real world many times, but not always, less confrontational, there's social graces and so forth, social intelligent, and generations of human interaction protocols, right? So this is not, this is not hard and fast, but we've seen many of these behaviors happening. Okay, now finally, digital ethics, the, the, the thing we've wanted to get to. So what, what does that mean? digital ethics and how does that, how does that operate in, in our workplaces in our greater world. So my tweaking of this term and this, this definition is that 
Digital ethics is about how we live and work in this new paradigm. It is about how we represent ourselves honestly and take responsibility for both our actions and our participation in our communities. But it is also about our stewardship, modeling good, safe behavior, and being cautious of our personal assets. Again, it's information, okay? Now, let's go and switch to cybersecurity, another theme of our conference here. So where do, these th where do these things play together? What is the relationship between privacy and security? So the terms personal and private, they actually have different meanings. And so, you know, I, I, I wasn't sure if I was going to be speaking to a, a room full of, uh, of uh, PhDs in economics, so I was going to make this, you know, Karl Marx joke here, so we can all, we can all see that. Uh, there, are different there are different expressions and, and definitions uh, for what these terms private and personal mean. Uh, depending on the type of economic uh, principles that you're uh, working with. But let's just back up a moment and look at what these terms mean in English for us uh, today and, and where they came from. So it's, it's actually very interesting because I, I, I didn't quite know the etymological underpinnings of these terms. So privacy actually, a private matter or secret, right? It goes back several hundred years. But the, the more interesting thing in the, the definition of privacy is the state of freedom from intrusion, right? The state of freedom from intrusion, which means it's not just about yourself, it's about your interaction with the world and how the world interacts with you, presumably intruding on your space. And personal is pertaining to the self. It's sort of more clearly identified as, as the person and not necessarily an interaction, right? Now, collecting information today. What is, what's possible, what's happening, and who cares, right? We've been talking about this already in the last couple sessions about, uh, Dr. Hess had mentioned this in uh, his opening session about his, uh, the personal devices, asking him how he was feeling and all that. So these are these devices now that are here. And I know that this is happening, and I, I've read some articles about that, and it's kind of, it is in some ways kind of scary because you can have, you could be talking about something and your phone's there, you don't think the series on, right? But how is it that, my mother told me recently that she was talking about like Japanese drapery and something else and it was, it was like a highly specific thing. And within like a day, she was getting advertisements for Japanese drapery on, you know, platinum rods or something like that. There's no way that there was, you know, something was listening, right? So, you know, it's tagging us, right? So the, the example I give is, you know, you write something in your email, hi mom, how's Cookie, poor sick dog, and soon you're getting swamped with emails about Oreos, NyQuil, and puppies, right? So it has nothing to do with those things. Um, so voice activation tools for conversation aggregating. These, these tools are now. Also more insidious, it's actually very interesting, using, looking at where the origin of these terms come from, right? Insidious actually means in wait and ambush an artificer stratagem. So, you know, are these things actually, are they really insidious? I, I think so in some ways. Um, the, uh, the other example that I wanted to do, so it's related to this, facial recognition, self-ophelia, bio-recognition. Um, what happens with your image? If you put your image online, or if it's somewhere in, in social media, and what dictates the circumstances of its use? Any, any, are there any attorneys in the audience here? No? Uh, I was hoping there would be, actually. And does this matter, though, if uh, other individuals, companies, uh, governments use faci uh, facial recognition data for other purposes? Uh, this is, of course, a big uh, issue in, in China right now. And then the Costco example, cost, uh, you know, Costco has a database of your photo because you're in its membership. And so when you get a membership card, and it has, I have, I have one, and it has your picture on the back. So you go in, and somebody's looking at a camera, a security, secure, let's see, this, uh, this security system. So they were selling it. Somebody goes and looks at it, and they're staring, and there's, you know, the, the camera's there, it's recording. And then what, do you, what happens? Within, within 24 hours, you're getting bombarded with, for sales. Like, are you interested in buying this camera? Because they had your image on the camera, and then they had your image in the database, and they're sending you that information. So, what's the future? The future is the present, right? Technology that records and identifies you. It these are other tools that are out there, 
how widely they're used, I don't know, but uh, this is a question, you know, again, about our personal space and private space and how that, uh, how that is negotiated in the world. So there are, there's technology out there now that records and stores your unique EK EKG, meaning your heart, heartbeat. You could walk down the street and say we have these machines that target you and they can record your heartbeat, right, as a, as a unique fingerprint. Same thing with your walk pattern or your gait. There are some that can store in uh, breathing patterns. And the same, it's an assessment of your social biology. And this leads to what's now known as digital phenotyping. Digital phenotyping was written about uh, in the last few years. And it's basically something that aggregates you as a, as a biological person, biological and social person, and can make a determination about you, whether or not, in, in, form of in forms of artificial intelligence, whether or not it's true, it's making determinations about you based on these data points. So for instance, and as an example, these are potential ex ex interpretations of you posting something. Ah, uh, sick again today. Some people may, it, it may interpret that as chronic health issues. Oh, I have a headache, underlying symptoms, not getting along with so-and-so, personal problems, instability. One of those days, family workplace issues, don't feel like going out, depression, what's your favorite scotch, substance issues, party time, reliability. I mean, we wouldn't necessarily think that those have anything to do with these other terms, right? It's an interpretation. But that is the state of some of, the, uh, some of what's going on today. There's the bad and good, right, so of, of digital phenotyping. Um, again, it's you know, the, the, the most recent uh, um, definition that's given uh, for digital phenotyping is the moment-by-moment -moment -moment quantification of the individual level human phenotype using data from personal digital devices. It, I mean, it's, it's also interesting. I, have my, I had got a new iPhone recently, and you know, it was several months after I realized that it was recording my every steps, every 10 minutes where I was going. And so I looked at it, and it, so it was interesting, because then it knew when I was getting up, when I was going to bed, when I wasn't moving you know, at work, sitting at my chair. And then I realized it was syncing with when I woke up, because whenever I woke up, immediately before I woke up, I would get like, like a, a bunch of emails about things that I was interested in. Like just before, you know, it was like 6.38, I'd get all these emails about something. And it was like just before I was getting, getting up during the week. So, Sort of, again, in, you know, invasive and insidious. Um, on the positive side, uh, there's, there's some interesting things that have come out with the new iWatch. Uh, there's a sensor that can tell if a person has fallen, uh, a pers you know, an older person who may be living by themselves. And so if, uh, if they can record if the person has fallen and if there's no movement for 60 seconds, then they'll call uh, their emergency contact list of that person. So the body as data, how can, how can this information be used by whom? And it is, is it actually a commodity. So aggregated data can be sold to third parties by certain groups collecting information. Uh, it can be used to inform potential insurance agencies. Uh, and is there any insurance people here today? It'd be interesting to hear your feedback on that. Data points of the digital phenotype can be used to assess your personal risk, can be used to consider credit worthiness, and then the question really is, where is the law today, right? You know, if you're looking at things that are trying to predict, I mean, that's, the, that's what's the mode we're in right now is predictive uh, AI to, to determine what your behaviors are so that technology can get ahead of you to take care of, you know, whatever, whatever your needs are. There was a, uh, I was at a summit last year, uh, artificial intelligence summit last year in cybersecurity, Summit, and uh, they they talked about the examples of uh, one of the Japanese airlines, which is using some artificial intelligence to determine, uh, you know, if a person there was there was the example of there was a gentleman whose flight was canceled, and so he missed his second flight to Tokyo, and so the artificial intelligence basically did all the rebooking, uh, got the, you know booked the his um, hotel, his car. Uh, figured out what his favorite meals were, what he liked, you know, with his scotch, uh, you know, all these sort of, you know, very personal things, and it was all done without a, a human intervention. Another interesting thing here 
uh, has to do with a program that uh, Indiana University put out last year, which was to employ AI as a tool to engage with students uh, who needed to register, who needed to pay their tuition bills, uh, and other outstanding uh, costs. And so they, uh, um, this I think it was last September, so they would basically, if uh, they, uh, the AI would prompt the student for certain information as to whether they, you know, would you like to pay your tuition bill now, or you've got a parking ticket, do you want that to be on your mom's credit card, or you know, all these sorts of things. Um, and uh, now, where that goes into being perhaps a little bit more, you know, legalistically challenged in dealing with the privacy laws is, there these tools then can be used for. If a student is doing poorly in a class, then they can say, well, maybe you need to make a, an appointment with your, your professor. I'm going to, you know, AI, am going to make an appointment with your professor. Um, or if AI detects, you know, as with Facebook, Facebook has, has uh, said that they have tools to predict whether or not a person is suicidal. Now, where are the, where are the rules around that? Where, is, where are the legal questions around that? So, of course, Dealing with uh, FERPA and HIPAA rules are really important when we kind of move forward with this. Again, this is what I just mentioned, the question of what is, what's the role that uh, these companies are using and how, how does it fit within our legal system? I think we've, we've heard a little bit today about how the legal system and legislatures are still a little bit slow, but I think that's also because technology is really fast and how those two meet together uh, is really, really important. And so as we're getting toward the end here, uh, the question then is, are we in a new form of capitalism? Uh, uh, Shoshana Zuboff, uh, phenomenal intellectual, uh, she is actually the one that came up with this term, the smart, ma smart machine or the age of the smart machine. Actually. Uh, I, I saw her uh, give a, a talk uh, last year, and she's, I think she's still at Harvard in the business school. And what she said was, in the early, late 70s and early 80s, she was, she was uh, interviewing people in a, uh, a steel factory somewhere in the south. And uh, she, she was talking to people about, you know, asking what they thought about changes in technology and all this. And uh, one, of the, one of the workers actually said that, you know, he thought the smart machines were going to take over, and that's where she got the term. But her work is really interesting. In some ways, she, she is, the, she is uh, the sort of Karl Marx of the late 20th century. Um, and I, I say that affectionately because what she really wanted to do, um, this book, In the Age of the Smart Machine, is a fantastic book. This one, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, is coming out. Uh, in six months, so there are articles about it, but the book itself is not coming out until next year. Um, but I highly recommend her work. Um, she basically said she wished that, in the introduction of this book, she wished that she had been alive during the Industrial Revolution so that she could interview people working in factories to see what they thought about, you know, these mechanical things taking their jobs. And then she realized that she could do that, but for the computer age. And it's a really, it's a very well written, very thoughtful work, and uh, much of what she's done has been profoundly impactful and influential for not just this conference, but for the work in cybersecurity and technology and the changes in, in society for the last quarter century. And so what about Amazon, right? I mean, that's, the, that's the, one of the elephants in the room. Uh, we're, you know, we're willing to, many of us, uh, put our money into Amazon, get things because of the desire to have material and buy things quickly. Um, how does that fit into everything that we do? You know, can we go cold turkey on Amazon? Um, and what's the role of, of that in higher education, in our lives, in other areas? I heard an interesting thing, and I've been trying to, I've been trying to figure out how, how this, this actually worked. Now, if you look at the history of Amazon, it actually was, was not making much money. In fact, I think in its profits even today, it's not, it's not, it doesn't have a high profit uh, value. But why are they making billions of dollars then? Why is it, it, was, why is it so, so valued? Well, uh, at this same uh, technology summit I went to last year, there were a, a couple uh, uh, scholars there who suggested that 
it, again, talking about information and, and information as a commodity, that the reason Amazon is so strong and so powerful and growing so much is that for, uh, for every dollar that is, in, that is being spent in Amazon, you know, when you, you we make these comparisons, for every dollar, how much is Walmart making? You know, it's like you know, 23 cents or something later. How much is Google making or whatever? Some, some people believe that actually Amazon is making something like $3 for every dollar because they've commodified your information, right? The, the commodity is something that's not going away. It's not like you burn coal and you have to go dig a hole again for coal. It's information that's just, it's continually produced, right? Information is always going to be there. So it's an interesting idea. And so as we uh, conclude today with, a f with some time left, the question is how do we balance our lives in the 21st century, um, especially those desires of presenting ourselves to one another right, in the world with the concerns of how we are as individuals and our data is collected, aggregated, commodified, sold, and used for untold purposes. So how do we balance our lives? And so I wasn't sure how many people would be here or how the room would be formed, but I, I wanted to offer these uh, few questions up for people to think about today and have a conversation around. So how, has, how have you changed as a person in the last 5, 10, 20, so forth years? How has technology changed? How have you adapted? How has, has your concept of responsibility changed? Because again, responsibility may have changed depending on how we interact with different technologies, with different devices, with the internet, you know? Some of us do remember before the internet, it was a very different world. How frequently do you use social media? Have your social behaviors changed with social media? What do you see as the greatest challenge in our privacy? And what do you see as the, as, as the potential solutions? And where are the other fields in this? Law, legislation, education, business, and so forth. How are your responsibilities different today? And how do you think they'll be in five or 10 years? And what do you think about this paradox of us on social media, us in the world, the technological world, and being, being watched in some ways? Not to sound paranoid, right? Uh, the, 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 the best of, the, of these lines that I heard, again, from Zuboff was, we all heard Big Brother, right? Big Brother is old news, you know, from the olden days. She actually came up with this, this new term, Big Other, right? Which is the amorphous, you know, AI, cyber technological, uh, you know, whatever it is, ether, that's collecting our information, right? And doing with it whatever it it pleases to. So with that, <laughs> thank you. And if you have any questions or want to discuss those points, I'll be happy to do so.